you can worship uh, with us. And also just to give a special welcome to those who've been traveling, uh, who are back. Some of you have been away for a while and you're back and we're so excited to have you here uh, with us as well. One of the things we're saying with this Refresh series is even though we've been rushing into the new year, that's what we always do, this is going to be a different year for us because we sense God is asking us to ease into the year and to go a little slower into it and to wait for his empowering, to wait for his refreshing. Uh, because the things he wants to do through us this year, we cannot do by our own strength. And we've, kind of, we've talked about the last couple of weeks, we've talked about how to have a refreshed mind. We've talked about how to have a refreshed body. And you can actually go on our website and uh, check out the, on, our, on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to see uh, any of the sermons from the last couple of weeks. And also, if you've not been here, you can get a DVD after the service. Uh, those are always uh, available for you. And I'm so looking forward. This is our month of prayer and fasting as well. And I know many of you have been going through uh, this together, and we're looking forward to ending it. Uh, this, is our, this is our last week. Can you believe how fast this month is moving? I, I, I don't know, I'm just growing older, and just life just seems to be moving faster. Is, is it just me? Are, are you guys noticing that time just seems to be moving faster? It just, it's amazing. It's 24th already. Uh, the month is almost over. This is our last week. And I'm really looking forward to Feb the 5th when we come and we have a worship night and we celebrate God together. And we receive some testimonies because I believe God is already answering prayers uh, as we pray together as a congregation. Now, one thing I love about the new year, I really love the sense of passion and energy that the new year brings to us. Uh, it's, it's very interesting because that's a time when we have so much, I mean, we're so excited in the new year. It just feels like it's something new. I mean, we, can, we, we almost get that sense, I can overcome the obstacles. I can do the things I couldn't do before. Uh, we get that sense of I can start afresh. I can, I can, the things I failed, that failed me last year, I can actually overcome them. Every one of us just, there's almost this flicker of hope, this sense of, my goodness, everything is possible as we start the new year. And so many of us have begun, uh, the, we're in the gym now, uh, we're doing that detox program, we're doing all those things. I mean, somebody came, by the way, one of the guys, as I was greeting people outside church, I just have to say this, uh, one of you, I'm not even looking at you right now, told me, Pastor M, you need the gym. He pointed at my public opinion. And I just said, watch this space. Because uh, this is a new year, yeah? And by, by April, just there's going to be a six-pack here. In Jesus' name. Somebody just uh, believe with me right now. It's going to happen. Because it's a new year. And we're excited about the new year. And you know something? It's so amazing because at the new year, the gyms are full. Isn't it? Any of you have noticed the gym is full? Uh, or you didn't notice because you're also one of the guys who's never there other times. Gyms are full, but the other places that's full is where? Church is also full. You're right. Church is also full. Because why, we, why is church full? Because there's a sense of hope as well when it comes to spiritual things. I mean, there's that sense of, my goodness, I mean, maybe this is a year. Some of us who are here, by the way, maybe you've not been to church for a long time. But you're here at the beginning of the year because you sense this. I pray this is a year when I really connect with God. I pray this is a year when I, I overcome my spiritual hurdles, the things that have held me back. And some of you, by the way, maybe you tried. And maybe you actually have been walking with God. It hasn't gone so well. And you're saying, I really hope this year it's going to be different. And maybe some of us have been walking with God and maybe it's been going well, but you're sensing, you know what, I need to move to the next level. And what better time than the new year to trust God to take me uh, to the next level in my faith. But you know, all too soon, with all the hopes that we have for the new year, the reality of January sets in. And it's back to work and it's back to traffic and it's back to the office. It's back to that boss you don't like. It's back to that job that you really dread waking up on Mondays to go to. And you know, it's back to living for the weekend and waiting for the public holidays. And some of us, the new year looks like, I saw a little mem uh, on the internet. Uh, do, you have, do you guys have that? Uh, there's a little, yeah, some of you, your New Year's resolutions by April will be looking like this. Huh? Keep it up, keep it up, because we haven't seen it yet. Yeah, so New Year's resolutions for two, okay, which year was it? Uh, because you kind of cross them and it's like lose, yeah, whatever. Get fit. Okay, let's just push that to next year. Give up. Oh my gosh, just forget it. Stand up to the boss, not cancelled. You're already written. Find a new job because it's just not working. Be nice to my wife. Now you've been, it went to try to be nice. Then it went to my ex-wife because it's like, it's over. Uh, sort out the junk in my, you know, it was tied with your garage, but now it's going to my life because you're just in a mess. Many of us, reality hits, isn't it? Life happens, and by April, the New Year's, I'm even saying April, some of you already, it's happened. 
New Year is over and you're just, life has happened. And life just has a way of sapping our passion. And nowhere is this more true than when it comes to spiritual things. Life just has a way of draining us when it comes to the things of God. And you know, it's interesting because you'd often think that preachers are immune to stuff like this. But I want to say, this happens to me as well. I mean, there are things in my life during the year that just knock me over and remove, they just drain my passion. And I was trying to think about some of those things. And I, I, there are a couple of things that for me are really draining. Uh, one of the things that really sorts me out, and I just know it drains my desire to serve, is criticism by people who should know better. You know, I'm one of those guys, I think over leading Mavuno for the last 10 years and then being in ministry for another 13 years before that, I think I've developed a thick skin and I can take criticism pretty well. But I think when criticism comes from somebody who should know better, and for me, I'm talking about many times when I've been criticized by Christians, uh, even Christian leaders who have said Mavuno this or Pastor M this, that man who does this, and I thought, they didn't, you didn't question, you didn't even ask me. You've not even come to Mavuno. You've not even, I remember one guy, I, I actually called him because I read something he published. And I wrote to him and I said, have you ever been to Mavuno Church? He said, never. I said, have you ever heard a sermon I've preached? He said, never. I said, how dare you write something libelous about me like that? And I think those, that, that honestly just knocks my energy. It drains me completely. I remember another thing that drains me. Can I be real? You guys are looking shocked like your pastor isn't meant to be real. We're a real church, isn't it? I can be real. Another thing that drains my passion is, I call it the futility of preaching. You know, pastors work on sermons, and we put energy and prayer into it. And one of the things that drains me the most is preaching with all my heart, and then finding a Mavunite who's doing, you know, you, you find them, and they're doing the exact opposite. And you saw them raising their hand for the altar call, by the way. They didn't, they're, they're, you, we went this way as a church, and they're going that way. Last scene heading. And it breaks my heart. It really breaks my heart. And by the way, there are times I've just looked at it and said, why am I doing this? Uh, and there are times I felt like giving up. And by the way, there are those moments. I remember once, I, I don't talk about them often, but I remember one moment of unguarded, just realness with my wife. It wasn't too long ago. And I told her, sweetie, this is how I feel. I think at some point she almost told me, okay, it's okay, I don't really want to know. Uh, you know how people get too real and you're like, hey, okay, pastor, you cannot, you're my pastor also, remember. And it's like, yeah, you feel like giving up. Life drains our passion for God. Life, if you're anything like me, there are many things that drain your passion for God. And whether it's busyness in your life, whether it's the challenges that come across your way, whether it's wrong decisions you made in the past that still haunt you, or whether it's just that humdrum, you know, you get into the routine of life and it's just not fun anymore and prayer is hard and God just doesn't seem to be there and things are just not working out and you just feel like giving up. And you know, life has things that just kill our passion and make us not feel energized at all in our relationship with God. And you know, I ask myself if this is really our year to refresh, how do we ensure that this doesn't happen to us? How do we ensure that we don't just come into this place and we're like, God, refresh me. And then by April, it's like, whatever, man. Uh, I'm just holding on for dear life and waiting for 2017. How do we ensure that that doesn't become our fate? And you know, I, 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 I started reading the Bible and asking God, speak to me about this. And I found a very unusual story. I found a story about a man who I consider a hero for me in the faith. This man was so passionate for God. He was so unstoppable in his faith that he just committed. Once he got to know Jesus, by the way, he gave up everything. And he decided, I'm going to serve God with all my heart. He, he traveled from town to town sharing to, with people about Jesus. And whatever obstacle happened to him, the guy just seemed to become stronger. I mean, he was shipwrecked. I mean, he was, he, he, imagine he's going to serve God and then the ship cracks. What happened? Ship, shipwrecks and he's thrown in the ocean, he's abandoned in sea. What would most of you say? Hey, it wasn't God's will. God wasn't really in that thing. Guess what he does? He gets on that ship, he finds his way to shore, and he continues preaching. I mean, this guy was unstoppable. He was bitten by a snake. What did he do? He just shook it off, and he continued preaching. The guy was stoned. He was beaten by the guys he was preaching to. What does he do? He raises himself up. He's just treated. He continues preaching. The man was thrown into jail. He continued. Of course, you know who I'm talking about, isn't it? The Apostle Paul. I mean, this guy was such an amazing saint. And I looked at him and I said, this guy, was he just a superhuman? I mean, was he just a guy who never, 
something, something never fazed him. He just never seems to be discouraged. I said, how did this guy maintain his passion? And then I found this text. And this text really ministered to me. And it's in the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 to 17. And it's a really amazing text for me because it's about a man who we consider a hero of the faith, a man who we consider just somebody who could not be stopped. But then we find this text where the man is discouraged. And I believe that the things he learned are things that are going to help every single one of us be refreshed whenever discouragement comes across our way this year. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 to 17. 2 Timothy chapter 1, 15 to 17. Let me read it from my Bible here. And here's what it says. He says this. He says, you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. So here's Paul, <laughs> abandoned. He says, everyone has abandoned me. So all the guys that he was preaching to, he's in the province, a province called Asia, and everyone he's preaching to, all the guys he's blessed, all the guys whose children he's prayed for, they've all abandoned him. And he even mentions two guys that he was not expecting. You know those guys you don't expect. Is there somebody in your life you'd be like, this one will never leave me. Together forever. BFF. <laughs> the BFFs left him. And he says, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. And he says, may the Lord show mercy. This is something that he says interestingly in that discouraged place. He says, may the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. So clearly, there are many people who are ashamed of Paul's situation, because Paul was in chains at the time he wrote this. But this man was not ashamed. And he says, on the contrary, verse 17, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. Father, I just want to pray for your people today as we read your word. Father, inevitably storms will come our way, even as we ask you to refresh us at the beginning of the year. And I pray, Lord, that the word that you've given to us today, it will be a word that would sink deep into the consciousness of every one of us. And that, Lord, you would feed us in the spirit, every one of us. And that, Lord, there will be enough left over to bless others around us. I pray against the work of the enemy, the discourager, the one who comes to keep your people in bondage. And I bind all his works and any power that he has over your people today. And I pray that, Lord, instead today you would set free your people and you would restore us to who you want us to be. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and God's people say it. Amen. So imagine the scene with me. It's a cold, dark cell. The young, the, there's a dim ray of light that shines through the, through the opening at the top of the cell. And in the dark part of the cell, there sits an aged, weathered man, small man, chained to the wall. And as he's sitting there, the place is dank and smelly. And then there's a sound. And dust starts to come through as the door is opened. And down the staircase, a sound comes as somebody's coming down. And the man squints into the light to see who's coming to visit him. He's looking, wondering, what trouble has come to me now? And then he hears a familiar voice. Paul, Paul, I found you at last. The man stands up with joy. He says, Ones. I mean, surely if your friend is called Onesiphorus, and he's really your friend. You can't call a guy that, isn't it? He's your boy. <laughs> oh, yes! It's you! And they hug. And they're so excited. And the man said, you can't believe how long it's taken me to find you through the bureaucracy of the Roman prison system. And they share. And the man says, let me remember my manners. And he brings out a bag. And he has cheese. And he has fruits. And he has fresh milk for poor. And he refreshes the man. And he's so excited. And he stays on his visit as long as the guards will allow him. And now that he's found his friend, he comes every day and it refreshes him and, 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 and tells him the news about what's going on on the outside. And every time he comes, the man in the cell is refreshed and encouraged. You know, I picture this scene because, you know, there's something that God, I sense, wants to speak to us. 
We've talked about how to have a refreshed mind throughout 2016. We've talked about how to have a refreshed body throughout 2016. But I sense there's another part of us that God wants to keep refreshed this year, and that is our heart. God wants every one of us to have a refreshed heart this year. The heart in many cultures, many ancient cultures, was known as the seat of the emotions. It's where passion resides. It's that fire on the inside. It's that drive that fuels you to keep going when you feel like giving up. It's that fire that keeps you going when all the discouragement comes against you and you, you still keep going anyway. That's the passion that is in the heart. It's that thing that distinguishes you as a leader because it makes people believe in the vision God has given you and want to follow you because of the passion that God has put in you. That fire on the inside affects everything that you have on the outside. You know, one of my favorite movies of all time, it's an old movie, some of you are too, too young to know it. It was called Braveheart. Where are you born? You are, huh? All right, some, you're not as young as you look. This movie has a guy called William Wallace, played by Mel Gibson. And William is a freedom fighter. He loves freedom. He's passionate about freedom. Finally, he's betrayed. And he's put in, uh, he's locked up. And somebody comes to tell him, you know what? You need to renounce what you're doing. Because if you don't, you will die. They'll make you die. They'll kill you. So give up. And I love the words he shares. Those are just the words that go into a soul of a man. You, you know, there are those movies you just pause and then you just re return it. It's like re re replay. What did he just say? Because this is what he said. He said, all men die, but not all men truly live. I replay. Some, some things need to be said twice. All men die, but not all men truly live. Do you know there are some people who died a long time before they stopped breathing? Do you know there may be some dead people sitting next to you? Because what they're doing is just living life, putting one step in front of the other. Just running after opportunities, running after whatever opens up. No big purpose to life. And he says, you know what, you, that's, that's not exist, that's not living, that's existing. You must have something big to live for. And he says, I'd rather die for something I believe in than just live existing. Live without truly living. All men die, but not all men truly live. Famous author Rick Warren says, passion is what energizes life. It turns the impossible into the possible. And he says this, if you don't have passion in your life, you're not living, you're only existing. You see, Jesus created you for a passionate life. I love when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment is. He actually spoke about passion. You know the, you know the verse, he says, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I love the way the message puts it. Because in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, what Jesus said was, love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. Are you feeling that? With all your passion, love God with your passion. Love God with your prayer and love God with your intelligence. Everything you have, let it be alive for God. In John chapter 10 verse 10, Jesus said, my purpose is to give life in all its fullness. You see, Jesus doesn't want you to live a half life. He wants you to live a full life, a life of fulfillment, a life of impact, a life of joy. This is what we were created for. But if that's the case, then why do so many Christians live life, start, start with so much joy, and then find themselves just drained of life, existing in their faith, no joy, no, no, no zeal? What happens to us? You know, here's a secret that I learned from Paul, because as I prayed about this, I really do believe God led me to this passage. Here's a secret I learned from Paul about staying passionate, and it is this, that I cannot do it by myself. I cannot do it by myself. No man is an island. None of us was created to be passionate about God by ourselves. You need somebody else who will encourage you, who will help you in your time of need, who will keep your passion alive. I wanna just do something really bold right now and speak to all the bedside Baptists who are watching this streaming right now from their bed. 
I want to say you will never be great alone. Listening to sermons by themselves will not help you be everything God created you to be. You need to be in the fellowship of other believers to grow in your faith. I hope you're listening. <laughs> you see, passion is not something that stays static. A fire either grows or it burns out. A fire can't just burn, isn't it? A fire has to be growing or it just burns out. You cannot just keep fire to yourself. Uh, keep a small fire and not, not keep adding fuel to it. And it's the same thing, that we must keep fueling our faith. And the way we fuel our faith is by connecting with others who are passionate about the same things. Others who have similar values to us. And they stoke our faith. They energize us. They make us keep wanting to move on. And Paul says, because of this man, I was refreshed in my faith. Paul himself was refreshed. You know, there's this story that I, I heard about a, a pastor who went to visit a guy who no longer came to church. And he was a little concerned about him. And it was a cold day when he went. And there was a fire in the fireplace. And so when the man gave the pastor a cup of tea, the pastor just sat down. And this man kind of had a feeling what the pastor wanted to talk about, so he didn't want to start the subject. So he kept quiet as well. And it was quiet for a bit as they just stayed by the fire. Then the pastor decided to do something. He decided to take a coal out of the fire. One of the, one of the, one of the, 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 the logs that was burning, he took a, something with it and he pulled it out and he put it by the side. Still in the fireplace, but he put it by the side. And then he kept quiet and he continued drinking his tea. And the man looked and observed the log. The fire was still burning brightly, but with time the inevitable happened. This log stopped burning as brightly and it started going out. Then the pastor took his things and he stood up to go. And the man said to the pastor, I get it. Thank you for that fiery sermon. <laughs> see you in church next Sunday. You see, none of us was created to burn alone. The greatest passion killer. I'll tell you, there are many passion killers as a Christian. But the greatest passion killer is isolation. It's isolation. Yes, you're passionate for God in your office. Yes, you want to be a fearless influencer. Yes, you want to make a difference. But let me tell you a secret here. The greatest passion killer is isolation. The devil knows it. He knows it. He wants to separate you. What do people do in prison when they want somebody to be kept away and, and, and to stop being such a fiery person? What do they do? They lock him up in solitary confinement. Yeah, they put you in solitary confinement. Why? Because they know you can beat up the walls all you want, but you can't make any trouble when you're alone. And the devil knows this. He wants, he wants Christians in solitary confinement, living your Christian life by yourself, unable to make any impact on anybody else or to be encouraged and refreshed by other people. No man is an island, and the greatest passion killer is isolation. And I've seen it for many years. I've been a pastor long enough that I've observed this. That many times you find somebody with such passion and then you find, you know what happened? Somehow, at some point, they just lost their passion for God. I've seen people who had such passion, I looked up to them. There are people who even mentored me in high school. <laughs> they were so passionate for Jesus back in the day. Even when I was not a Christian, they were the guys who were praying for me. But you know something? After college, something just began to happen. And it began to be about something else and something else. But you know, the pattern becomes the same. Pretty soon you're going to find that this guy isn't in church. And by church, I'm not talking about a religious thing, about attending a service. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that this guy is no longer surrounded by people of common values who are praying with them and who are walking with him. And you just find that he's surrounded by other people, the people who are making things happen as he thinks. And then slowly the next thing is almost inevitable. Coldness of heart. And the person is just, you know, he still calls himself a Christian. She still calls herself a Christian. But if they were really honest, they would admit that I'm just a shadow of the self that I was when I really was on fire for God. The greatest passion killer is isolation. Now, in, in, interestingly, this name, Onesiphorus, Ones, it means bringing profit. Somebody who brings profit or somebody who is useful. And that's exactly what happened to Paul. 
This man brought profit to his friend. He added value to Paul's life. That's what friends do. When you have friends with common values, they add value to you. Two ways that he added value to Paul's life. And I want us to, to, to note these two ways because they're the ways that God wants us to be added value to this year as others refresh us. The first is by his presence. By his presence. You know, it was interesting because Ones just showed up. He just showed up. The Bible doesn't tell us what stories he gave Paul. He doesn't tell us what he brought him. I was just making that up. He just showed up. His presence was the most important thing. Just being with someone in their time of need says, I care about you and I'm here to go through this with you. You know, we live in an age of Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And so it's so easy. We've become guys of... <laughs> that's what we do, isn't it? We use that to, be, to tell people we're with them. You know, it's like... How many, you know, we, we do that. R.I.P. Rest in peace. When somebody has expressed something really crazy happened in their family. R.I.P. Tukopamoja. I feel you, man. Praying with you. But it's almost like we've lost the ability to be with each other. We almost feel like we've showed up because we wrote it on Twitter. But it's not the same. Real friends show up. Onesiphorus could have decided, my goodness, I mean, look at him. He actually, it cost him to show up. Because you know what? It costs to show up, doesn't it? Especially in these busy days, it costs to show up. It's so much easier to send a tweet or to send an inbox and to say, I feel you. But look at Onesiphorus. I mean, he left where he was. He went to Rome. And then he went to Rome and he associated with a man who had been accused of treason. I mean, the, this guy was about to be executed for treason against the Roman Empire. I mean, it was almost like you going to Guantanamo Bay to look for a buddy of yours that you're in Primo with. Anybody feeling me here? You know how you're going to be on the blacklist of every embassy in the world. It's like you're over because you're going to be watched by everybody after that. I mean, he risks his reputation to go and look for this man called Paul. He goes into a Rome that was hostile to Christians because we're told by historians around this time the emperor of Rome was a man called Nero, a madman. This guy hated Christians with a passion. And he used them as a guinea pig. to show Whenever anything went wrong, he blamed it on the Christians. And at his time, Christians were burnt. I mean, they were actually put up on stakes and burnt for lighting. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he perfected the art of torture. He put them in the, in, 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 in the lion's den, literally. I mean, he put them in the Colosseum, the big stadium, uh, for sport. And lions would fight against them and destroy them just to entertain the masses. A political gimmick. You know, our politicians are good at that, isn't it? Bring the entertainers, bring the music, and keep the masses entertained. So what does Nero do? He throws Christians in there to entertain the masses. Onesiphorus goes into a Rome that is like that, risking his life and reputation just to be with Paul. Let me ask you a question. Who is your Ones? Who's that guy? Who's that girl? Who's that person where it doesn't matter how things are thick, they'll be there? Who's that person for you? Do you have a person like that? And who considers you their honest? Is it okay if you just write right now? Just, take, just, just write it down. You know why? I don't want this to be a theoretical question because I want you to ask them after this whether they actually think what you think is true. Yeah? Who's your honest? Do you actually have somebody who you know if I was in the fire? That person would risk their reputation. They would stop everything and they would come and be with me. Who is your honest? Some of you are assuming it's your spouse. <laughs> Make sure you look at her list also. <laughs> Who is your honest? Because the greatest passion killer is isolation. We need people who will be with us even when our fire is going down. Second thing honesty for us does is he, he blesses Paul, he refreshes Paul by his acceptance. By his acceptance, by his presence and by his acceptance. Paul says, Onesiphorus was not ashamed of his chains. You know, Paul, when you read this, this is his last letter that he writes. And this is a letter when he had already, it seems like he already knew that he was going to die. And he wrote this letter to a very close friend, uh, Timothy. And when you read this letter, you actually feel the pain of the man. Because he writes about how discouraged he is at the betrayal of people who are close to him. In chapter 4, he talks about a man called Demas. Demas must have been somebody who was in their team together. And he said, this man, he loved the world and he abandoned me. And then he writes about another man called Alexander the metal worker. 
This one was even worse because he says, He did me a great deal of harm. Chapter 4, verse 14. And then he says, when he, it was time to be tried, when he had his trial, because he'd been arrested for treason, when he showed up for the, for the, tre- for the trial, none of his friends showed up. Not a single one of them. He said, all of them abandoned me. Everybody deserted me. By the way, this is a guy who has blessed them. He has loved them. He has served them. He has died for them. He has healed their children. He's been there for them. Every one of them abandoned him. And this is what Paul says. But you know, it's so interesting because he says some of them were even ashamed. He implies that they're even ashamed of him. I wonder why they were ashamed. Maybe they just felt, you know, I don't want this reputation to mess my business. Maybe some of them just felt, you know, Paul actually brought this on himself. We told him to tone it down. And he just continued being radical. Now look at what he has done to himself. Maybe that's what they thought. But you see, Ones was different. Ones was different. He never came and looked down on Paul because of his chains. He didn't act like the chains weren't there either. He didn't tell Paul, if only you had more faith. Sometimes friends can give you really interesting advice. (laughs) <laughs> he didn't come and tell Paul, you know, you know the apostle Peter, even him he was in prison like you, but he prayed. Do you ever get friends who give you advice like that? They're telling you a story about someone else and you know it's about you right now that they're talking about. Huh? <laughs> they're, they're giving you a really spiritual lesson, but they're, they're trying to make it look like a story. He didn't lecture Paul. He accepted him as he was with his junk, with his mess, everything. He accepted him as he was and he was not ashamed of his chain. You know, there are people who are there, who are in this congregation, who are ready to accept you with all your issues, all of them. But the problem for many of us is often we are too busy, or we don't want to be inconvenienced to let such people come in. Here at Mavuno, we say we're real people with real issues before a real God. (laughs) We need that real God. Let me tell you, we all have issues. Every one of us. If I could tell you some of my issues, some of you would stand up right now and leave this church. You would. Because I have issues as well. And I need, I need people around me who will encourage me when it comes to my issues. I cannot do this thing alone. I become too big a target for the enemy. And my prayer is, even as you hear this message today, some of you had a message like this at Mavuno before. Some of you even have lived a life of encouragement and refueling in a great life group. But right now you're not in a group like that. You're not. And you're doing faith alone and you're a fearless influencer. But you don't realize just how vulnerable you are to discouragement and to being drained of your refreshment because of being isolated as a believer. And my prayer for you is that you will say that this is the day that I'm going to change that. That this will be one of the things you do in 2016. I'm going to join another group. I'm going to start another group. I'm going to form a group around me. And we're going to do this. By the way, as I speak, I speak to myself. When I moved to this area, my life group broke up. Because some of us stayed in Kilimani, where I lived. And half of us moved here. And for the last year, my wife and I have been not in a life group. (laughs) And one of the things we're saying through this Refresh Challenge is we want to reconnect with community. We must be in a group of people who care for us. Because we don't want our fire to go out as a family. And my prayer is that every single one of us will make that commitment and be part of a group like this. Because the greatest passion killer is isolation. It's isolation. You know, I love this practical verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. This was my wedding verse. Um, I told you guys I sang for my wife when she walked up the aisle. So this is a verse. I made the song out of this verse. It's a fantastic verse. It worked for marriage, but it also works for life as Christians. It says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Yeah. Someone who falls alone is in real trouble. We all need an honest in our lives. Ask your neighbor, who is your honest? Uh huh. Who is that person? Who's your honest? Are they really your honest? Or are you just thinking they're your honest? Maybe that was your honest for 2014. <laughs> and they're no longer your honest. Who is your honest? Who's that person who's going to help your passion keep burning? 
I want to conclude. And I want to say we have our prayer altars. For those who've been away, we've been doing prayer altars. And we have them in our service. We have our prayer altar right here. And some of you, maybe what you need to do today is come and write down a prayer and stick it in to one of the grills. It's our prayer wall. And just write a prayer and say, God, I need friends. I need real people I can be real with. Some of you need to overcome a fear and say, Lord, I, 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 please help me overcome a fear of being too close to people. And just write that as your prayer and trust God to help you with that. We also have our reconciliation altar. And here's what I want us to do with our reconciliation altar. I want to challenge you, either today or next week, as a life group, for those of you who are in those groups, to actually come together and share communion together at this table and reaffirm your commitment to be each other's honestness, to be there for one another. I really believe this is what God wants us to be. There's a confession altar. And for some of you, what God is calling you to do is just to confess. Bring confession before God and say, God, forgive me because I've walked away from people. I've tried to live this life by myself. I've tried to live it in a way I was not designed to live it. And say, God, forgive me for that. Maybe I was hurt by people in my life group and I stormed out really angry and I said I would never be close to people again. And just write that as a confession and say, God, help me not to be that. And you can put that in the confession altar. And we just want to pray for you as you do that. Some of you need to confess your addictions and workaholism and the things that keep you away from community. And write those down as well and put them in the baggage altar. And that's the baggage. The baggage altar is the things we burn every week. And we say, God, free your people from those things. And I'm going to put those out there out in front of you. So after this service and early next week, I've, I've noticed many of you come early for the service. Come and use the altars because they're here and they're open for you. But I want to pray for us. I want to pray for us. And I want to pray for every single one of us. I believe that God's desire for us is every one of us will be refreshed. I believe that God's desire for us is every one of us will be so full of Jesus that wherever we go, people will see it. I believe that God's desire for us is that, you know, we'll be so effective in our relationship with Him and so, so infectious in our joy that people will want to follow Him just by seeing us. This is what I believe. And I believe that God wants us to be in such close-knit community that people will come and say, why are these people here for you? Or why are you here for these people? Is it because you're relatives? Is it because you're from the same tribe? What is it? And people will say, there must be a God among those people because their relationships are real. This is my prayer when people walk into this church, that they will see real relationships, real love for each other, and that God will cause us to be that community that loves one another. So I want to pray for us, if you just allow me to pray. Father, I thank you for your people. And I thank you that, Lord, you've called us to walk in community. You've called us to walk not isolated, because the greatest passion killer is isolation. And Lord, we want to be renewed, we want to be refreshed. This is our prayer, Lord, refresh us. But Father, I thank you because you've given us the tools. And this week you've given us that secret. That, Lord, it's as we connect with others, as we walk this journey together, that you will cause us to be so there for each other, that in difficult times and in good times, we'll be strong and our fire will not go down because there are people who are constantly with us. They have our back. And I pray that, Lord, this would be that kind of congregation. None of us will just be a spiritual consumer coming in and leaving, but every one of us will be there committed to others, to bless others as we ourselves are being blessed. Father, I thank you for somebody who's here. I just sense that you want me to pray for somebody here who's coming to church and has just come to seek you. And for some reason, they walked away from their faith some time back. <laughs> and as they hear this message, the one thing that they're desiring right now is to enter relationship with you one more time. And I thank you that at the beginning of this year, Lord, it's a time you call us to renew that anyway. And so I know there's somebody who's here. You've heard my sound of my voice. Maybe this is not even what I was preaching about. But you're saying, Pastor Emma, I would like to recommit my life to Jesus. Or maybe you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus. And you're saying, you know what, I would like to do that today. Because I want to belong to this community of people. And to have such people in my life. And to follow a God like this. And if this is you, I'm going to ask you to just raise up your hand wherever you are. 
just raise it up and then put it down again. And I would just like to pray for you. We're going to celebrate you and pray for you. Just raise it up real high and put it down again. Anybody who's here, I just sense that God is speaking. And there's some of us who are here and God has been speaking so strongly through this message. And you're saying, Pastor, I am, what other time will I wait for? Don't worry about the person next to you. Just raise your hand. I see you, my sister. Thank you so much for you. Let's appreciate her as she puts up her hand. I see you, my sister, as well. To God be the glory for you. To God be the glory. Come on, Mavuno, we can do better than that. Anybody else? Just raise your hand real high in the air. Say, Pastor M, pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus today. Just raise it up real high and then put it down again. We thank, I thank you, my sister. To God be the glory for you. To God be the glory for you. Anybody else? Just join those who put up their hands and say, you know what? I'm going to start this year different. I thank you, my brother, as well. To God be the glory for you. To God be the glory. This is not about emotion. It's about a decision that I am making, that I will follow Jesus, and I want to follow this kind of God. I'm not doing it for a pastor. I'm doing it because my God has called me to align to him and enter that relationship. One last time. Anybody else? I want to pray for those who put up their hands. But if you're here, thank you, my brother, as well. I see your hand as well. To God be the glory. I see another brother as well in the middle there. Thank God for you. To God be the glory for you. To God be the glory. Thank you so much for those who put up their hands. I want to pray for you as we conclude. And I'm going to ask you to say this prayer after me. For those of you who put up your hand, I'm going to invite you to just raise your hand one more time. Just raise it up in the heavens before your God. You're, it's raising it up in surrender before your God. Just raise it up real high before your God. And you're raising it up in surrender. And pray this prayer after me. If you've prayed this prayer before, join them as they pray. Dear Jesus, I come to you today to surrender my life to you. Thank you that you died for my sin. And thank you that you love me so much that you brought me to hear your word this morning. From this day forward, I surrender my life to you. I give it all to you. Forgive my sins. Come in and be my Lord. And I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's appreciate every single one of those who put up their hand. We bless the Lord for you. I bless the Lord for you. To God be the glory for you. I also want to pray for just a few people here who've lost their passion for God. You've gone to a place where you love God. You know you love God. You haven't walked away from Him. But right now it's so routine. And you're one of those people who's saying, I need God's refreshment. I need God's refreshment. And I'm going to ask you to do a really bold thing. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right now. You're saying, God, I want you to restore my first love. I want to love you like I did at first. I know right now I'm not there yet, but I believe you're going to do it. Come on, just stand up wherever you are. I believe that there are quite a few of you. God has been speaking to you. You're with your wife. You can even stand up together as a couple. You know that your faith is not where it should have been. Come on, let's appreciate them as we stand, as they stand. And you're saying, pray for me, pastor. I want to renew this faith. I want to follow him with joy. I want him to fill me again like he did. To God be the glory for all those who are standing. I'm going to ask you as you stand, just raise your hand in surrender. You know, the most important thing for us as Christians is surrender before God. And I thank God for everyone whose hand is standing up right now, symbolizing your surrender. Symbolizing, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Lord, look at your sons and daughters as they stand up. Some of them have walked with you for many years. Some of them have walked with you just recently. But right now, Lord, every one of them is in that dry place where they're saying, I need refreshing. I need refreshing. Father God, I want to thank you for them. Thank you that you brought them to church today because you had an appointment with them. And I thank you, Lord, that as they surrender to you, that, Lord, you're more than able to give them the desire of their heart. Lord, there's no person who can desire God unless God himself works in their heart to cause that desire. And I thank you that, Lord, even as they stand right now with this great desire, that, Lord, you're already fueling that desire. And I pray, Lord, that you would make them hungry for you. I pray that, Lord, you'd give them an insatiable desire for you. I pray that, Lord, you'd begin to even engage them at their time of prayer. I pray that, Lord, their worship of you would become sweet. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would refill them again with your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would refresh them. I speak refreshing over you, brothers and sisters. I speak the encourage, uh, encouragement of the living God upon you. I speak that your Father loves you and he wants you back and he's so happy to see you desiring him. And I pray that the Lord will just give you such a fresh passion for him. And that this year will be so different from the year that you just passed. That the Lord would fuel you with such a passion for him. And you'd begin to be seen, even by people around you. People will ask, what is different about you? And I speak over you that this will not even be something you psych for. 
that God will just give you this desire and you will run after him. So Lord, refresh your children. Refresh your children. Refresh your children. Let me invite the rest of us to join them and stand up right now as we conclude our service. The greatest passion killer. The greatest passion killer. The greatest passion killer. Tell your neighbor, don't be isolated. Don't be isolated. I want to encourage you and invite you if you'd like to ask questions about the zones you're going to be in for the refresh challenge. All the signboards at the back. There are going to be assistants there to help you. So ask any questions you have. Uh, the numbers are going to come up on the screen as well in case you forgot your zone. Inevitably, I know that you did. Uh, it's Sunday morning after all. Uh, so they're going to be there as well. So check out your zone. You can ask any questions. If you registered online uh, and, you, and you're already in a life group, you could actually go and tell them, I've already registered, but I shouldn't have. So cancel that because I want to do this with my life group. We want to encourage as many life groups to do it in their homes as possible. Uh, so this is something that you're, you're doing it together as a group. And those who are not in life groups, we want to create the opportunity then for you to do it together and in one of the slots that we're going to create here. But it's going to be a phenomenal time. I really trust God that he's going to refresh you this week. Father God, I speak over your people that you will refresh them this week. Hey God, there are many people who want to take off, but before we take off, we have to be refreshed. Before this becomes our year of taking off, it has to become our year of refreshment. And so I speak over your people, Lord that you would refresh us. Lord, many of us have been fasting and praying this month. I pray that this week would just be a phenomenal week as we fast and pray and wait on you. I pray that, Lord, of our lunch, you'd remind us even to take prayer walks around our office and around where we are, and that, Lord, it will be a refreshing time. I pray for us as we read your word, as we're reading through the book of Matthew. Lord, I pray that you would refresh us as well and that your word would be so rich to us and you'd show us more and more of yourself as we seek you in your word. And Lord, I pray that you'd refresh our businesses. Hey Lord, I'm praying for fresh business ideas over your people in Jesus' name. They will no longer keep doing the things they did in the past, but they will listen to God for wisdom. I pray for fresh ideas for our marriages, Lord. Some of our marriages, Lord, are stuck in a rut and we're doing the same old, same old. And I'm praying that, Lord, you just bring a new fire, a new zeal, a new spark in that friendship. Lord, I pray for a new, a new fire in our parenting. Give us ideas on how we can be parents who glorify you. Lord, I pray for a new spark in even just knowing how to govern our lives and our careers. And I pray, Lord, refresh your people. God's people, be refreshed. Be refreshed. Be refreshed. We're going to walk out quietly so that we can give space for the altars. And anyone who wants to stay behind and pray at the altars, you're welcome to do that. May God bless you and refresh you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.